Welcome to UOA On Demand. Uh, tonight's topic is on osteochondritis desiccans. I'm Chris Barrow, sports medicine specialist, and I'm joined tonight by my esteemed colleagues and fellow sports medicine specialist, Dr. Charles Gatt and Dr. Patrick Buckley. How are you tonight, guys? Good. Thanks, Chris. Hi. Hey, Chris. So osteochondritis desiccans, uh, what exactly is it? Uh, it's a poorly understood uh, generator of pain in joints um, that can happen uh, in many different people uh, and many different age groups. Uh, Dr. Gatt, uh, potentially you could tell us about um, who does it happen to and explain a little bit more about what it is. So osteochondritis descans is something we see you know, primarily in young kind of adolescent athletes, but we do see in a lot of different ages. It tends to occur most commonly in the knee and the elbow. I mean, there's are two most common I see, although it can occur in other parts of the body. Um, and the theory on, on what causes it, because I can tell you we're not 100% sure about the cause of osteochondritis is that it's due to repetitive microtrauma that can result in potentially a a loss of blood supply to the ends of the bones or little micro fractures in the bones that end up resulting in pieces of bone and cartilage separating from the end of the bone. Um, again, we're not really sure if it's a loss of blood supply or if it's just small cracks in the bone that cause inflammation, but in any event, it does lead to usually mechanical type pain in the joint. It can start off as achy pain, but then the patients get kind of catching sensations or almost locking sensations. And that's usually what brings them to the office. Absolutely. And, and as you mentioned, we don't exactly know what causes it. Uh, there can be many different factors like vascular uh, genetic factors as well. Uh, but as you mentioned, we're, we're uh, kind of going off that it, most of it can be traumatic, uh, particularly in athletic populations. Um, as uh, Dr. Gatt mentioned, uh, it can happen in athletes. And, and Dr. Buckley, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, who gets this? Uh, males, females, what age groups? Sure. Yeah, this is something that can happen in both males and females. Uh, we tend to see it in a, a younger population that has this if their growth plates are open. Uh, and it can present really based on the kind of severity of the problem. So if you're young and have a big lesion that's potentially um, unstable, then usually that will be a younger patient. But it can present uh, in an older age group. Uh, you may see a 40 or 50 year old who has this and they've just been relatively asymptomatic for, you know, much of their adult life. And then they've presented at that time once it becomes symptomatic. So um, it can happen really across the spectrum of ages. Um, and really, it comes down to the, the when the symptoms bother them that they present uh, that we would kind of start uh, looking into it. Absolutely. And, and as you mentioned, it, it can happen earlier on in life. So we do see it in a lot of younger athletes. Uh, particularly young males, uh, we'll, we'll see it a lot. And as, as you said, uh, we may not even see these symptoms present until you get older and then all of a sudden they start to bother you. And that's when we start to see a lot of older patients present. Um, that said, uh, Dr. Gett, uh, how do these patients present? What kind of uh, clinical signs and symptoms do they see? What kind of history do we hear? Well, there's, there's we actually a big spectrum of, of present, presenting symptoms. If they present to you early, it may just be an aching type of pain that's related to you know, running or jumping, or if it's an elbow throwing, and they don't, they don't really have a history of injuring their joint at all, so they're not really sure why it hurts. Um, as it progresses down the spectrum, then you, start, then you start to see maybe some swelling in the joint, like a little fluid in the knee or the elbow. And again, as it kind of gets a little bit further along, they actually feel like, they get, like something's getting stuck or something's getting caught. And in the absolute worst case scenario, if you want to call it that, the piece, the osteochondritis desiccans piece actually breaks free and becomes a loose body in the knee joint. And somebody can say, I actually feel something almost pop out of my knee and I shove it back in. And that's, you know, then you know that the, you know, they've reached the late stage of osteochondritis desiccans. So it really, like I said, depending on how, you know, concerned they are about their well-being, you know, they come in early and some people blow it off until it gets really late. Definitely. And, and as you said, we see it a lot in knees and elbows, uh, mostly with pain, swelling, uh, occasionally catching or locking symptoms, and, and no traumatic incident to speak of sometimes. Um, so what will we do if these patients come into our office, uh, Dr. Buckley? What, what would be the next step as far as uh, imaging or workup? 
Yeah, certainly. I think what uh, Charlie said about history, we listen, especially listening for that uh, symptom of mechanical problems or fusions is going to be one of the things, especially in the knee that we're going to look out for. Uh, and then we'll, you know, go to an exam. And so we're going to look at, you know, the body part, assess if there's something else that would give their pain, uh, assess for their ligament status. But specifically for this, we're really going to be looking at their uh, effusion. So that means whether there's any fluid in the knee. Uh, and trying to decide if that, the potential uh, cartilage defect has led to uh, fluid to build up in the knee. Uh, we're also going to assess for their motion. So if there's a block to their motion or there is a potential piece that's limiting that motion, uh, that's going to be a concern. And, you know, there's kind of a couple tests and, and you want to really check for, uh, you know, this lesion being a problem if you try to extend the knee from a flex position uh, and the pain is worse with the uh, internal rotation, that may be a problem that, you know, kind of pretends us to look further into their um, uh, exam and, and look further into the imaging to, to kind of diagnose this. But, you know, as with most of orthopedics, we're going to get an x-ray and really try to look at uh, the knee, look at whether they have growth plates that are open or closed. And what's really helpful, and this is where it can often be missed from like an urgent care or uh, an ER type setting is we'll often get a, a bent view of the knee, which allows us to look um, kind of at the condyle of the knee as it comes into a little bit of flexion. Um, and so that notch view uh, allows us to look at, at the most common areas where we'll see this cartilage defect uh, showing up. And if we see it, then we're going to really probably look at this more with an MRI and, and look at all the kind of size, the location, you know, try to decide if this is stable or unstable. Um, all the different parts of, uh, you know, what we factor in to treat this. Absolutely. And, and as you mentioned, a lot of times we'll even see this on an x-ray, uh, kind of like a scalloped lesion in the part of the knee that's affected. And uh, most of the time we will see it on the inside aspect of the knee and the back part of it, that medial femoral condyle, as you mentioned. And uh, we can see it in other parts, though. We can see it underneath the kneecap. We can see it on the other side of the knee. And I think an MRI is very helpful. Um, Dr. Gat, uh, what would we see on an MRI? So on the MRI, what you, you'll see is an area where it looks like a, like you said, almost like a scallop lesion, but a piece of uh, the cartilage and the bone, the signal changes in it. So in a typical MRI, if you're looking at one where the marrow looks kind of dark, it'll look, um, the marrow will look light and it'll be shaped like a crescent. And then you, what you really you have to very carefully look at the MRI because there's a lot of fine details that we look for because as uh, Pat pointed out, what we're really concerned about is the stability of the fragment. So if you see a crescent of fluid, but the cartilage covering looks okay and it's intact, you can kind of consider that a stable lesion. But if you start to look like you're developing a, a fluid layer, like a thin white line of joint fluid that's separating the, the fragment from the rest of the bone, then you start to get concerned about the stability of the fragment. And those findings really are the things that affect our treatment plan. And I, the one other thing I, I think we need to bring out is that, you know, we also on our x-rays, we want to look at the growth plates, right? If these are, if the growth plates are open and the, and the kids still have room to grow, you know, our treatment is a little bit different than when their growth plates are closed. Then you can also see that on an MRI as well. Yeah, those are very good points. Uh, and as you mentioned, with the MRI, really, that, that points us in the way we'll develop our treatment plan, whether it'll be non-operative or operative treatment options that we could present to the patient. Uh, other prognostic factors, like you mentioned, age uh, besides stability. And so that, that's why we look at the growth plates, as well as maybe even the size of the lesion, what part, you know, how much of the knee does it really involve? Yeah. Um, so I guess moving on to treatment options. Uh, if we consider this to be a somewhat stable lesion um, that that really doesn't need surgery, uh, what kind of treatment options do we have non-operatively, uh, Dr. Buckley? Sure. Yeah, and I think that's the majority of these. If we have open growth plates, I would say that most of us are, are probably steering that person into non-operative treatment um, and at least a trial of that. Uh, I think the two main things are, are number one, really rest, which, you know, sounds easy to say here, but when you picture, you know, a 12 year old, uh, active, you know, athlete telling him to rest and not, you know, run and to play sport, uh, be in gym, it's easier said than done. And so a lot of this is really having that discussion with the parents and trying to say, look, 
you know, you want to have a reasonable approach to this. Um, sometimes just taking them out of more defined or kind of structured sports is the best you can do. Uh, you can brace, um, you know, patients and you can kind of put them in the braces. You can try to put them on crutches. I think crutches is overkill personally. And I, I, I try to really just talk about relative rest. And if I really need to, and the parents are like, we got to put them in something to, to brace them, I will. Um, but in general, those are the way that we're really treating this non-operatively is trying to avoid the activities that are, that are going to potentially make this worse. Um, but at the end of the day, if you have a 10 year old kid in front of you, you know, they're going to be a kid in many ways. And so you have to have some bit of common sense when you're doing that, but that's what really non-operative treatment, um, looks like. And the other thing to really talk about is probably the duration. Um, you know, and so when, when I treat this or, or most of us are going to treat this non-operatively, it's not like a week or two, you know, a restriction that you're often doing. Usually it's, you know, a couple months that you're trying to tell someone to rest and to, uh, let this heal. And those are hard pills to swallow because often this is, you know, somebody who is in season and plays a sport and, and doesn't want to necessarily, um, you know, rest, which uh, is really the best treatment if there are growth plates are open. Right. Um, definitely. And those are good points to mention as well that, so rest is an important part of the non-operative treatment protocol. And, and as you mentioned, not always easy to get everyone to remain partial or non-weight bearing for a four to six weeks on crutches. Uh, but if we do see a stable lesion, there is a chance that we can get it to heal. And I think rest is an important part of that as, as well as all the other modalities you mentioned. And potentially if we don't adhere to those, uh, this can end up being an unstable lesion uh, and that might require surgery. Um, and there are a lot of different surgical options as well. Uh, Dr. Gatt, uh, if we did need to go to surgery, um, what would determine uh, what does that? Why, why would we need to go to surgery? So, you know, first of all, the number one would be a, a failure of non-operative management. So if you have a lesion, you know, as Dr. As Pat pointed out, you know, a lot of these are seen in adolescent athletes. If their growth plates are closed, they really do have a high chance of healing, but they all don't. Then other ones start to look like, well, it, it's a, a little bit on the border. So again, you may steer them in a non-operative uh, course for a little while and see if they improve. And a lot of times they actually do improve. The problem is then when they go back to activities, they almost get a reoccurrence of the symptoms. So now you realize that even though they got better, it's because of their relative rest. But once they go back to full activities, the instability of the lesion kind of bears itself out. So that's when you start to talk to them about surgery. If, if the lesion is sitting where, right where it belongs, um, you know that can be treated arthroscopically. You can look inside the knee, you know, with the camera, the size of a pencil and, you know, kind of loosen up the fragment a little bit, maybe clean up the backside. But basically what you're doing is pinning it in place. And I tend to use these um, bioabsorbable tacks. Um, they're just a little, they're called smart nails, but they're little tacks that just press the piece against the bone by drilling through the bone. It kind of gets some of the fresh marrow supply into it. And it, it's a very stable fixation point and then you know they can that's done as same day surgery you do have to protect them after surgery they can't put a lot of weight on it if it goes to the extreme where the piece becomes a free floating piece and the or it's been free floating for quite a while then you really have to decide is the piece salvageable because number one if it breaks free it, it may fragment and they break into you know three or four smaller pieces which then really aren't amenable to treatment Depending on the location, you could just take them out and the patients can do really well. Um, sometimes you get in there and there's a nice big piece floating around the knee, but now it's kind of, it's gotten bigger than it used to be. And you may have to trim it down before you can put it back to where it belongs. But, you know, there are, there's not an, it's not uncommon to have a case where the piece has been damaged so much that it, you can't put it back. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think, uh, as you mentioned, so options for treatment in those cases can be fixation or just kind of debridement or removal of a, a fragmented piece. Um, and Dr. Buckley, it, does size play a role here? Is it always done, are surgeries always done arthroscopically? And so if, if it's a large uh, piece, do we do any uh, kind of a, a different approach? Uh, for sure. If it's a large piece, you know, you really want to make sure you get good fixation if it is an unstable piece and uh, that may need to be done open. Uh, and that's something that, you know, you just can get better fixation. Also, depending on where the lesion is, 
Uh, if it's far posterior, kind of deep into the, um, the condyle of the knee, it sometimes can be a hard thing to do arthroscopically and to do it well, you actually are really better off making an incision and doing it like that. So, you know, all of these, I, I think it's a little hard to, um, you know, make a, a general statement because there's so many variables and, you know, this is where going to places um, that do a lot of this matter because you want to have someone that has the experience of what's the right thing so you can do this and, and get the best chance for this to heal um, versus trying to, you know, maybe potentially do it arthroscopically, but knowing that you know, the right thing is to open it and that comes with experience. Definitely. And, and so we can't always fix these lesions either. Um, as you mentioned, Dr. Gatt, sometimes they're fragmented or they may just be too large for us really to, uh, to deal with. Are there any other treatment options? Have we developed any kind of uh, ways to plug up a hole in essence um, uh, to, to, make this, to make this better and really uh, resurface that chondral area, uh, Dr. Gatt? Yeah, um, there are several ways to do it. I, I think unfortunately in orthopedics, the thing we do less well least well is make cartilage grow back but you know we really have some new technologies that are exciting um you know one of one option is to take um little cores of bone and cartilage from another part of the knee and put them into the hole that's called you know osteochondral autograph replacement another option if the if it's bigger and you can't take enough plugs to fill it the hole you can do an osteochondral allograft in other words you could take tissue from a donor that fits into the hole and kind of size it up just right and plug the hole that way. And then there's um, newer techniques, autologous chondrocyte implantation, and now um, where we would take a small biopsy of normal cartilage from an unimportant part of the, of the knee and then send it off. And we basically what I tell patients is they digest the cartilage and they take the cells and they get them to replicate. And I'm making up numbers, but if we send them 100,000 cells, they send us back a million cells, and now they send it to us on a membrane, which would then we open the knee and sew this onto the onto the hole, and cartilage grows back in to fill the hole. So those are probably the three of, of the most common ways to do it. So we've talked about fixation, kind of debridement, uh, chondral resurfacing. Uh, and, and one thing, although we never really like to talk about this kind of end stage treatment option, I guess arthroplasty or replacement, uh, that can always be an option, particularly in older patients. Uh, Dr. Buckley, uh, is that something that we would consider for, for those patients? Certainly for an older population. Um, but, you know, uh, I would say that's very uh, uncommon to do for, for the younger population. You know, we're definitely going to be looking at joint preservation um, far more than kind of joint replacement. And if it's, you know, a non-salvageable lesion, then you uh, probably going to start looking at other risk factors for healing. So if you tried it once and maybe if it didn't work or it's a referral, then you're going to look at their alignment, uh, look at their ligament status and, and try to figure out really what is the reason why that may not have worked. Uh, and those are all correctable things, um, you know, versus trying to do a, a knee replacement uh, in somebody who's at a young age. So, Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, we do need to sometimes look for other reasons or other factors why uh, cartilage resurfacing or fixation doesn't always take or doesn't work. And as you mentioned, the uh, limb length alignment is, is, is one thing as is a uh, ligamentous uh, stability. Um, Dr. Gett, how, uh, how does surgical recovery go? Uh, when can people expect to return to work or athletic activity after uh, something like a fixation or a chondral resurfacing? Well, you know, it is a slow healing process. So I would say that the majority of patients that are managed surgically are probably on crutches for, you know, four to more like six weeks to be truthful. And around six weeks is when we let them start getting off crutches and putting weight on it. But I would avoid impact exercises like running and jumping for a minimum of three, if not four months. So I think, you know, you have to tell them you're looking at a four to six month return to sports, especially for some of the larger lesions. Yeah, I think I'll add one thing, Chris. Um, you know, I think it's good. I sometimes will explain to the patients as we talked about the etiology of this that it's really a, a we think it's a vascular problem, and in general, we have a problem of you know basically a dead cartilage um, or dead bone underneath of that, and we're trying to get it to regrow. 
And so, you know, these are things that I think that when you explain it like that and you say, look, this takes time, your body has to potentially take somebody that's something that's not uh, having blood supply to it. And we're going to do a treatment and then get it to grow back. I think they understand it uh, maybe a little better in the timing because these are not, you know, two week type recoveries. These are, are measured in months and you know, these are often a challenge because they, they take people out for seasons and, and then, you know, there's a lot of other factors to it, but that's how I explain it because that, that tends to hit home, I think. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, and Dr. Barkley, prognostically, what can we expect after something like this? Do factors like age or, or location of the lesion uh, play a part in what we can tell our patients when they'll get better? For sure. And age is the biggest one. And it's really a, um, a surrogate for having growth plates that are open or closed. So, you know, if we, we general apply rules that if you're a, a female, you kind of close uh, growing, uh, your growth, growth plates close around the age of 14. And most men are going to grow until around the age of 16. So if this presents in a, a 10 year old or an eight year old, we're going to give them a very high chance that this can heal almost assuredly with non-surgical treatment. Um, if this is a 15 year old boy who's got, you know, maybe six or nine months left of growing, that's one that you have a little more concern about whether this will heal. And then again, uh, when you fix that, if it does need surgery, that is, uh, plays a factor into your kind of treatment, uh, recommendations first and foremost, and then ultimately how you counsel them. Um, so age is a big part of it, but it's mostly a surrogate, uh, for growth plate, uh, whether they're open or closed. So with that being said, uh, we can try a little uh, case if that works for you. Um, so uh, gentlemen, you have a 17 year old male uh, track athlete who comes into your office complaining of pain for the last year. He doesn't really remember any kind of traumatic incident. Um, how would you start, uh, Dr. Gat? So I'm asking just a couple more questions. You know, I'd ask about whether he had effusions in his knee joint. And I'll often say, does your knee ever swell enough that you can't see your kneecap or something like that? I'll start to ask, um, you know, do you feel anything loose floating around in your knee? Of course, I'll ask him, you know, was there an injury? But, you know, he sounds like that that wasn't the case. So the history part of it is really very important. Um, and then my physical exam kind of confirms my history findings. So I'll check for where they hurt the most, see if they have fluid in the knee joint, um, you know, things like, you know, it's, and then uh, there's one test where you can extend the knee and turn the foot in a little bit. And sometimes that's a indication they might have a lesion on in the most common location, which is on the medial, the inner femoral condyle. So th that's how my history and physical examination go. So Dr. Buckley, uh, this patient has uh, just mild pain at rest, but mostly with weight bearing. Uh, he'll say it's worse. Uh, he has a mild kind of swelling in the knee or fluid effusion, as you mentioned. And occasionally he says his knee catches or locks up on him. Um, what's the next uh, test that we're, we're doing? Uh, definitely getting an x-ray next. And his x-ray shows kind of like a, a scalloped kind of lesion uh, at the medial femoral condyle, the posterior lateral aspect. So kind of in the back of that, that inside aspect of the knee, um, what are we doing then? What are we, we telling the patient and his, uh, his mother? Yeah. So I think at that point we, we have a presumed diagnosis and, you know, you still have to think about other reasons for pain. And so you have a, a track athlete and we think about stress or stress reactions. And, you know, those are more common in the, in the tibia or the shin bone, uh, probably than this area, but, you know, this is where you're talking about treatment and his growth plates are, are going to be closed at the age of 17. So, you're, you know, you're really talking about getting an MRI, but the first line treatment is really to kind of activity modify and uh, see how he does symptom wise with, you know, shutting it down. All right. And uh, so Dr. Gad, he, he's trying uh, conservative treatment. Um, maybe you've made him partial weight bearing for a few weeks. Uh, we're trying some physical therapy as well and some rest. And he states that, as you mentioned, it's gotten better when he rests, but every time he starts to go back to doing anything, it starts to hurt again, the same way it did before. Uh, is there another test that we'd order next? Yeah, so next would be the MRI, you know, to see, to assess the, the lesion itself. 
and assess for signs of stability or instability of the lesion. So again, looking for that fluid track that goes behind the lesion, because um, if that's the case, and he's already done some you know, conservative treatment, but the symptoms keep recurring, odds are this is heading, heading towards surgery for this patient. Right, and so this patient does get an MRI and he does show some fluid behind his lesion, uh, Dr. Buckley, and the, the lesion or, or the fragmented piece is measuring about 20 millimeters by 15 millimeters. It seems to be wholly intact and it doesn't seem to have come off the bone or it's not floating around in the joint. Uh, what treatment options can we present? Yeah, so I think a couple of things there, you know, we, we've kind of talked him through conservative treatment. Um, you know, at that point, I would think about this in, in two different ways. One, it sounds like the cartilage part of this is intact and, and fixable. And then I would next think about the bone underneath of that or the subchondral bone. Uh, and that matters because if you have, you know, a, a basically a cartilage cap, but the bone underneath of it or the um, architecture underneath of it isn't there to support it, you can try to fix it and it's probably not going to go as well. So those are the two factors that would kind of lead me into decide, you know, what to do, but he's looking at a surgery. And if it's a fixable piece, I think we would probably agree that you're all better off with the cartilage that you were born with. And so I would try to fix that piece, um, which often involves, you know, almost booking it open if it is stable, uh, roughening up the bone and, and kind of potentially drilling the bone below it to stimulate more growth uh, from the bone marrows and then fixing it. You know, and there's a couple of different ways you can fix it. I do think it makes sense if you're there to potentially take a biopsy for that, um, you know, the uh, Macy or kind of that uh, technique where you grow cartilage that Dr. Gatt mentioned. Since you're already there, there's really no downside of that. And it could potentially save you a second surgery if there were to be a failure down the road. So that's probably how I would treat him. That's a great point. And whether fixation or resurfacing is, is the ultimate a uh, definitive treatment option for this patient, he's still looking at a long recovery, uh, although a better prognosis at a young age. Um, so with that, I think we've covered a lot on osteochondritis desiccans. Um, uh, does anyone have anything to add or, or that they'd like to mention? Well, I think, you know, I, like we said, probably the, I do see it in uh, throwing athletes and you do have to pay attention for it. Um, not only throwing athletes, also gymnasts. I uh, uh, see it a lot in uh, young uh, female gymnasts, you know, because they they land on their hands as often as the rest of us land on our feet. So they do get these lesions, and they it can it can be a tough thing to recover from for them because they they need their arms. So you have to have just as high index of suspicion in a pitcher or a gymnast as you do in a runner or a, you know, somewhere where they come in for the knee. So. Don't know, don't forget about the elbow. And and I think a lot of the things that we discussed, I mean, literally everything we discussed is the same for the elbow. You know, if it's a young per, young person, open growth plates, relative rest, most of them are better. But if they get a little bit older, closer to age, um, and they have an unstable fragment, they they may they may need to be fixed. That's an excellent point. I mean, it happens more often in the knee, but we do see it a lot in the elbow as well. And just those types of athletes that you'd mentioned. And I think the symptoms would present the same pain, swelling, and occasional catching. All good points. Great. So if anyone does have any orthopedic issues or injuries, uh, we urge you to uh, get online to our website at uoanj.com. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thanks.